Hello, everyone. Welcome to OpenShift um, community meetings. So I am here with Ramon and Shaft, who will be talking about Conveyor AI. Conveyor is one of my favorite projects. Um, when I work with, with customers, we use it a lot for uh, migrations and modernizations. And I am really uh, interested to hear about Conveyor AI. So um, yeah, Ramon, all yours. OK, so. Uh... Hello, everyone. Ramon Romanissen here, product manager in Red Hat for the migration toolkit for applications and also a conveyor maintainer. And I'm here with my colleague, Shaf. Yeah, hello, everyone. Great to be here. I'm a developer advocate working with Conveyor, so, so nice to be here today. Perfect. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Ramon, uh, Shaf, feel free to share your screen. Okay, let's get to it. Just give me a second. Hopefully this works. Can you see my presentation now? Yes. Cool. Okay, let's get started then and start talking about this uh, new thing that we have with Conveyor AI uh, under the Conveyor community, uh, Gen AI for application modernization. So for those that are not familiar with Conveyor, let me do an overview of what Conveyor is all about, and then we can get into the specifics of what we're trying to do with uh, Conveyor AI. So uh, Conveyor is an open source project that got kickstarted around three years ago. Uh, and it was a joint effort between Red Hat and IBM uh, research at the beginning. Uh, since then, it has become a sandbox project, a sandbox project in the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And yeah, Conveyor is focused on uh, helping organizations with their um, with the onboarding of their traditional workloads into uh, Kubernetes to leverage cloud native technologies. And since it's onboarding on the cloud native uh, uh, computing foundation as a sandbox project, basically what we are trying to do is establish the standards for application onboarding into uh, Kubernetes for this uh, you know, usage of next gen uh, cloud native technologies. Since we got started, uh, we've added additional contributors. We have Clarinet now. We are collaborating with Microsoft, and we expect to join them as official maintainers and contributors in the short term. So this is a quite a lively community. And considering this is a, an OpenShift Commons uh, meeting and that I am a Red Hatter, uh, I can miss the opportunity to tell you about the Migration Toolkit for Applications, which is a downstream distribution of Conveyor that is uh, fully supported by Red Hat. It's available with no additional cost with any OpenShift subscription, so go try it. It comes out of the box uh, with uh, OpenShift with, without the need of any uh, additional um, subscription. So, uh, okay. Uh, talking a little bit more about uh, Conveyor, uh, Again, the idea is to um, help organizations with the onboarding of their workloads into Kubernetes. And the way we want to do it is by helping the uh, architects, uh, the enterprise architects with uh, with this endeavor by surfacing insights, as much information as, as possible for them to make, to make informed uh, decisions on, on, on whatever strategies and technologies they want to adopt when moving towards the cloud and, and Kubernetes. And one of the foundations for that is the uh, analysis engine that we have available in, in Conveyor. So basically, the way it works is that it allows uh, the users to find anti-patterns into their source code. And by anti-patterns uh, or issues, I mean anything that might be preventing those applications from running on a, uh, on a given target platform or runtime. This analysis engine does static source code analysis. It leverages technologies like the language server protocol. We wanted to tap into uh, community standards, and the language server protocol has been uh, there for a while, and it's being used to power IDEs. Uh, it's a technology that was developed by Microsoft, and it's powering VS, uh, Visual Studio Code. So pretty, pretty uh, interesting technology. And well, our analysis engine in the end is a rules engine. And, and we basically use these rules to find those anti-patterns. Out of the box, Conveyor comes with uh, 2,400 rules already to uh, that help with the migration towards different uh, migration paths. But it also offers the possibility of creating your own custom, custom rules to tackle uh, custom migration scenarios when you have or, or large organizations that use their own uh, frameworks, technologies, architectures. There's also possible to enhance the rule sets that come out of the box with uh, with Conveyor. 
uh, adding your own stuff to uh, tackle these uh, specific uh, migration use cases. And once you run the analysis, you get a report on where the stuff has been found and with guidance on how to uh, fix those issues. Uh, and it will be looking exactly like this. So you get you know very specific information about where the issues have been found down to the single line of source code out of the offending line of source code. And then you get a uh, you know pretty extensive explanation on how to solve uh, a certain issue, how to fix a certain issue. So you get a natural language description of what needs to be done. In some cases, you will even get uh, code snippets on how to perform the changes and links to external documentation. So that's, that's what we have today. And I wanna be super clear about how it works today. You will get guidance on how to solve the issue but the issue itself won't be solved by conveyor. It still requires a human being knowledgeable enough to understand what is being explained in here and then for, for that person to perform the changes manually on the source code following this guidance. And that's exactly what we want to tackle. Uh, like the next level is what we want to tackle with a conveyor AI, which we call Pi as well. And you know the overarching goal that we have for Kai is to improve the economics of application modernization and migration, and use uh, Gen AI for that. That's like the uh, overarching goal. But uh, the approach that we have is basically what we are chasing here is the uh, the uh, the holy grail of application modernization and migration, which is automated source code changes. We want to have something that uh, allows the user to get automated changes based on the issues that have been found. And the way we have built Kai is for it to um, leverage the knowledge that is stored in, in Conveyor about your organization. Conveyor helps you with the migration uh, of your applications and then stores information about how these applications have been migrated. We want to have something that is able to leverage that specific information about your organization and uses that to enhance the uh, knowledge that is stored in a uh, standard generic commercial LLM. One of the things that uh, we also want to avoid with uh, with Kai is uh, you know the need to use fine tuning uh, for uh, for those LLMs because fine tuning itself is a uh, an expensive activity in terms of infrastructure, in terms of resources. Uh, if finding you know skilled uh, folks out there is kind of hard, so we want to avoid that. And the way we are, we we are going to avoid that is by using retrieval augmented generation or a rack. And another of the foundations that we have with Kai is making it model agnostic. So uh, one of the things that need to be pretty clear about Kai is that it's not we're not bundling any LLM with Kai. Kai is an extension of Conveyor that allows a Conveyor to uh, leverage LLMs and provide additional context to those LLMs to get more accurate responses from, from, from them. But we are not bundling any LLM with Kai itself. What we want to have is something that is able to interact with multiple models and enable organizations to have a best of breed approach to uh, using LLMs, trying trying to get the most suitable LLM for each problem domain. For example, when you have a multi-language context for your migration, using the most uh, the most suitable model for each one of the languages that you're using to migrate your applications. So uh, let me dig a little bit deeper, uh, deeper on the uh, on the approach that we have for Kai. Uh, again, uh, Kai uses the data in Conveyor to generate uh, code suggestions. Uh, basically, again, we're, what we're trying to do is automate source code generation, and what we do is leverage code suggestion for uh, for uh, from a uh, LLM, and then use those suggestions to automate the uh, the changes via diffs in in an ID plugin or in an ID context at first, uh, there's there's more coming uh, to try to automate even further uh, beyond the ID experience, but that's what we're shooting for at the moment. And the way uh, Kai or the, the, the way the user experience in Kai is driven is completely based in the analysis engine. So we, we leverage the analysis engine to fix the issues, the problems that need to be addressed. And then those issues are reported to the LLM in order to find a fix for them. And when we are reporting the, those issues, we provide additional context for the LLM by leveraging the information that is uh, uh, stored in uh, in the conveyor instance. So for that, what we do is craft a tailored or custom LLM prompt. Basically, Kai is based on prompt engineering. 
to extract information uh, about the uh, specific problems that need to be addressed. And that will be extracted from this metadata that comes from, from, from the rules, this explanation on what needs to be done. But we will be also adding uh, additional context on uh, prior successful code changes on, on, on prior uh, fixes for, for similar issues that are found in the code base, in the organizational code base. And as I was saying before, uh, the idea is to provide the suggested code chains as a diff using an IDE plugin, and we will see more on that uh, during the demo. So the user experience is pretty straightforward. You will be a migrator. You will run an analysis against your source code. Then the analysis will find some issues, and then you will say, hey, I want to fix one of these issues. That will query the Kai API. Uh, Kai will... Uh, extract information from, from conveyors, stuff like, hey, uh, the analysis story, all the uh, migration, pr previous migration that have happened, application source code. It will be capable of finding previous resolutions of a, of a similar issue in the code base from the organization. And it could even leverage things like uh, the integration that we have with a uh, external task trackers or work, work trackers like, like Jira to understand when a certain application was migrated, if this application was migrated sex successfully, did it have this issue solved? Okay, it, it, it was solved in here. We have information about the before and after in the uh, source code repositories. So we are able to extract a suitable example of how that thing was fixed in the past and feed that to the LLM to add additional context and make it a little bit more uh, accurate in the, in the fix. There are several uh, concerns, limitations, challenges that uh, we will be facing when we are dealing with uh, LLMs. Uh, one of the things is that LLMs, at least at this moment, have very limited context windows. You just can't upload a full application into an LLM and expect it to automatically uh, migrate it. It's the, the, the context window is limited, so you have to chunk the problem solving, uh, solving in order to interact with them effectively. Uh, there's also the fact that if you're dealing with custom technologies, with custom architectures that the model wasn't trained uh, trained on previously, you need to augment the knowledge of that uh, LLM somehow. But fine tuning is out of the picture because it's normally expensive and resource intensive. And then there's this uh, concern about, hey, um, right now there's a prolifer proliferation of models out there. There are very uh, you know specialized models out there. I want to get the best model for the problem domain that I want to solve for the language that I'm trying to migrate. Uh, how can I do that? So uh, in the next slides, I'll be, I will be showing the approach that we got uh, to solve some of these problems. For example, when it comes to the limited uh, context window, what we are doing is breaking the larger migration problem into smaller ones, into smaller questions. And the way we're doing that is driven by by the uh, analysis engine. Basically, what we do, we have your source code, uh, our source code. We will run the analysis, find issues, and then make LLM requests for each one of these issues to try to find uh, solutions for them separately. And finally, aggregate the responses to get the uh, full migration of the application. That's, that could be done on a per issue basis if it's done manually, or it can be automated uh, if you have multiple um, multiple issues and you want to skip, basically you trust the the, the responses from from Kai and you want to uh, batch the uh, the application of those of those responses, or or um, or suggestions, or source code changes. Uh, that's it for the limited context. Then there's the the need to augment the uh, LLM knowledge. And the question is, how can we influence an LLM to give us better info or knowledge uh, it was trained on? So you could have, and let's go to uh, concrete examples from the field out there. It's pretty common that you have uh, organizations using their own technology. So on the Java realm or domain, for example, most organizations out there are using standard technologies like Java E or Jakarta E or Spring, Spring Boot, Quarkus, all those things. But normally they use their own flavor of those technologies. They 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 use those technologies as a foundation, but they then they they build their own customization uh, layers on top of that and build their their own frameworks and architectures. If you have an LLM that has been trained on Java EE or Jakarta EE or or Spring, and you ask specific questions about these custom technologies, it's very likely that you won't be getting uh, you know uh, good information. 
uh, from or good uh, answers from from the model because the model doesn't know the specifics of your own custom technology. So in order to infuse the model with this additional context, this custom context that comes from your custom technology, we are uh, following a retrieval augmented generation appro approach, a RAG approach, and what we do is build a few shot prompt. And the way we do it is by, well, of course, uh, we add some uh, original prompt instructions, some uh, base context, like I want to migrate, this, I want to migrate this thing, there's a, an occurrence of, of this problem in here. We provide a snippet of the source code that needs to be migrated, and then we provide this additional context. What do we provide? On one hand, the issues that were found on the coded snippet that we are passing uh, with a specific markers on, yeah, on this line, there's this issue. There is information about how to solve this issue that comes from the rules that we have in the rules engine. So we provide some context about where the issues are and how to solve them. And then on top of that, to provide even more context, we try to find uh, solved examples of that issue in the code base. So if it's if you're dealing with a large portfolio of applications, maybe this is like you know the 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 tenth application that has been migrated, and the same issue was solved like five applications ago, the idea is to find, look for those examples in the previous uh, code base from the organization, find what the solution was, and add that solution as additional context to the model. And then ask the question to the model and try to retrieve uh, a suitable uh, answer for them from, from there, and then present that to the end user as a diff that can be ac either accepted or rejected. Um, the main differentiator that 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 we have in Kai from other co-pilot clones, if we want to call them uh, that way, is that as we were saying, it uses this structure migration data uh, that we have in in conveyor in in MTA. So, as you uh, keep migrating your applications in you know, a large scale migration projects, it's very usual that the first iterations on 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 that migration will be very manual. But what what you want to do basically? If you have different archetypes or application types in your in your organization and you have tackled the migration of representative apps from all of them, once you have done that, it's it's very likely that the rest of the migration will be just repeating, uh, rinse and repeating the same uh, migration things. There's tons of repetitive migration uh, tasks to be done. And what we want to do is automate those repetitive tasks and leverage the, the knowledge that was accumulated on previous iterations of the uh, process. That's one of the key things that differentiate us um, from 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 other uh, co-pilot clones. There's also the fact that the uh, the way uh, the migration is structured, everything revolves about issues being found in the in the source code. So we add the analysis engine on top of the cap capabilities of the LLM to direct the LLM on what needs to be solved, uh, and. Again, one of the most important things is this uh, model agnostic approach that we have uh, for uh, for migration. Copilot, all their other things have their own built-in models. W I, again, I want to insist on 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 this. Kai doesn't come with any mo uh, bundled model. What we do is extend conveyor to be able to leverage models and that add this additional uh, context uh, to those models. So we can either use uh, commercial models, any commercial models uh, out there, or bring your own models and work with uh, other providers, uh, local models. For example, it would be an example of that would be a hugging face model hosted in OpenShift AI that, that would be perfectly suitable. So we want to have some sort of driver the la layer that allows to uh, allow Sky to interact effectively with all the models that we have uh, out there. So have an uh, agnostic uh, approach to, uh, to uh, leveraging LLM without being uh, coupled or, or you know, vendor locked with any of the models out there. And with that said, before we get into demo, any questions so far? Wow, I, I think it's it's an amazing all the stuff that you're doing. I was like, wow. Um, I I guess in a typical coding sprint, you know, you're doing your merging and all stuff like that. And I guess with this LLM, LLM it doesn't change that. But these will be new steps in this trunk based. Um, analysis where it would be useful. Well, what I'm trying to say is, uh, are, are the future coding sprints going to involve this LLM way of doing things and, rather than what we've normally been doing with the 
um, Visual Studio and those coding sprints where we all merging to Git and, and the CI/CD. Is that what we're saying that's going to be the future? And the hackathon uh, look like this pretty much? It depends on the uh, on the stage that you are in in this large scale migration project. And I keep saying large scale migration projects. When I say that, I, I, I mean hundreds or thousands of applications being migrated from runtime to the other or from one platform to the other. So it's very likely, as I was saying before, on the first iteration of this uh, migration engagement or initiative that you will be doing things in the classic way. And when you run into problems, you solve them, you document them in the shape of custom rules, and then you share them with the uh, wider ecosystem of uh, developers. And at a certain point, you have enough information to start asking at a, in the ID level on a per issue basis to start asking for auto fixes. So you will have your ID, you will have your plugin, uh, an issue will come up, you will say, hey, auto fix. And then it will be your responsibility to test that everything works and the emerging flow will be exactly the same. But we imagine getting to a certain point, let's say you have 5,000 applications, you've already migrated 500 of those applications and you, you've already, you already have a good knowledge base to automate on, on, on that. We are envisioning a situation in which instead of having to go on a per issue basis with your IDE, you will go on a repository level, say, hey, migrate everything because you already trust the data that you have in the model and the data that you have accumulated in, in Kai and Conveyor. The idea will be that you will migrate the application at repository level, and then a migrator will perform the final tweaks, ensure that everything works perfectly, and that application will be migrated. Does that answer the question? I'll take that as a yes. Okay, Shaf, uh, the stage is yours. Thanks. And you are muted. Okay, yeah. Yeah, now I'm on mute. I just realized that. Okay, let me share my screen to share the right one. Let's see. Let me know when you see my screen. There you are. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I guess, do you see the co controls as well or no? Hopefully not. Okay. Let's see. Perfect. So, <clears throat> yeah, thanks for that, uh, Ruman. That was really, really good. I'm going to carry on with that. I'm going to go through go through a demo. But before I do that, I'll quickly just uh, uh, talk about a couple of things here. Um, when we're talking about migration, obviously, from, from a holistic perspective, and I think Ramon touched on it quite a lot, and, and in our demo use case, we do something similar. You're looking at migration from legacy applications, usually a technical debt situation where you might be on an old frameworks, like maybe struts. Uh, I worked on that a long time ago. Hopefully, you're not doing that. Um, or something similar. And then obviously, when you have an old framework, you also have the problem uh, with, with, with changing the application code as you go on. You don't find enough resources. There's not enough uh, packaging out there. There's not enough uh, things that you can do with it. And that kind of hampers you from working. Plus, obviously, security risks as well, because these are old libraries. And I think we've seen these news items Hurling around, for example, in terms of uh, struts, is that you know there there has been users using that, and then they had CVs that they there were data leaks around it, which is extremely costly, right? And then finally, obviously, maintenance and cost of these applications, finding the right people to do it, etc. So there's there's tons of things why you would actually want to migrate your applications, but it's not just one application. I think Ramon touched on that. Is it's always more than one application, and if you were just migrating one application and it takes you maybe a couple of months or a year uh, to do that, multiply that by 200 or 500 and 2000, and then it's a huge project that probably never ends or people don't go into investing into that area. What this does is obviously it helps you to do this much, much more faster uh, with all the different kind of things that Ramon also mentioned, I'm gonna to touch on them. So my use case today, is migration of legacy code. In this case, I took the example of Java EE. So if you if you have developed in Java, Java EE is, uh, has been there since the early 2000s. That's how we have built code in, in enterprise Java. But now, most recently, it has moved to Jakarta EE. And then there are new frameworks like Quarkus, like Spring, like Elidon, Micronaut. So there's tons of them that actually do the, do the same thing in a much, much more lightweight fashion in a modernized way where you're more 
agile in, in, in working with it. And maybe even deploying on containers is much, much more simpler. So my example today is based on Java E to Quarkus, and, and that's what I'm going to show you. Um, the application that, that I'm going to showcase is a cool store application. Uh, very much simple. Uh, it, it's 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 a monolith application, and there's nothing bad with having a monolith. So let me just put that disclaimer out. Um, you can always have a monolith application, and you can always have microservices. It's purely a, an architecture choice. And as we learn these days, that you know both the choices uh, have their own use cases. So there's not not an either and or situation. In any way. When we look at the monolith application today, there is a user interface, which is a cool store app, which is where you go in, uh, you try to buy some nice cool uh, swag like uh, Red Hat t-shirts or or mugs or whatever you want. It's not the original cool store. Let me just tell you that before. So uh, it's not the actual Red Hat cool store. It's 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 a dummy uh, sort of a version of it, uh, if you put, say it like that. Um, and then obviously there's um, there's other functions which are in there component wise where you have an inventory which basically goes out, takes all the inventory of the products. It's it's a database uh, backend that's using Postgres at this time. Uh, we have a catalog, all the entries that come on top of the um, on on the UI interface, so you can see exactly what's in the catalog, and then you can you know add it to your um, to your shopping cart. So shopping cart is is keeping all the sessions uh, live and and using something like caching at the back end to ensure that you can you can store that. And then finally orders, which is again um, an interesting thing, right? Because when you check out something from a cart, it it has to go into orders, and there's some sort of this async process that you really require. And I'm going to show you how we do that migration and and what that means. Uh, I'm trying to keep that for the end. So hopefully I'll show that. And then finally payment as well. Again, it's a more like an async process, but in this monolith style architecture, we are doing it very synchronously as well. So how does that from a legacy technology using something like JMS? can convert into something more more modern, which is more asynchronous and reactive as well. So all of those things, you know, in, in the current application that that I will showcase you, uh, showcase to you as well. So let's do that. I think I'm gonna jump on and, and just show you. So here's my IDE. Um, I have a Visual Studio code. <clears throat> what I've done is that I've installed the uh, the conveyor extension. So I have a conveyor AI extension, and just to let you know, this is this is a very pre-phase uh, extension right now. It's it's not you know openly uh, readily out there for for consumption. It's it's in its early stages. It's 0 0.002 version. Uh, as you can see, I have an older version here. Uh, I use that, and once you know, once we once we bring this into the conveyor community, you'll be able to see that as well. What I do here on the Cool Store app is that obviously I give it an app name. Um, I, we have the Cantra CLI. So Cantra CLI basically does the static code analysis. If you're already familiar uh, with this toolkit, you know, upstream, you're using it, then Cantra CLI basically just goes in and checks all the different, you know, aspects of the applications. But in order for the Cantra CLI to do it, it needs, it needs certain, you know, inputs. So one of these inputs is that I'm using a Java EE application, I want to convert it to a Jakarta EE application. I want to I want to convert it to Quarkus. So Quarkus uses uh, the Jakarta EE libraries um, as well. Um, not all of them. It's compatible with them. So it uses some of them. So I'm saying, hey, I want to, you know, make sure that when you're looking at this code, look at it from an angle that I want to move this to Jakarta EE and Quarkus. And then finally, there's a set of custom rules that that we have also here which Cantra needs to know in order to go and search into the code and do the static code analysis. Once I run this analysis, obviously I've run this before already. Uh, once I run this analysis, it's going to give me, um, you know, certain aspects like, oh, there's there's certain problems uh, within the code as well. So let's do this that I'm going to, I feel a little bullish. I'm going to try to run this analysis again. Um, and, and as this analysis is running, it's going through all of the different source code that I have and basically taking out all the different elements using the custom rules that um, that we used. So it seems like uh, my bullish nature is sort of uh, working fine. While it does that, while it does the analysis, it should take about 60 seconds more or something. I'll just hop on back and I'll say like, when we talk about conveyor AI, 
the core ingredient, one of the core ingredients is the static code analysis. We have to ensure that we can get that static code analysis that we do from Conveyor IO today as well, which most of you do. But then once we have the analysis report, once we have the details and the incidents about uh, what's going on in the code, then we can feed that into Conveyor AI and ensure that we get the right response from Conveyor AI to generate those patches. So I think one of the questions was, how do we work this with Git? And I'm just going to show you that uh, in a second as well. So it's still analyzing at this point. Uh, I think I'm maybe uh, running a bit high on resources while on radio. Uh, so we're going to let that happen. But let's jump on a little bit further. And once that happens, when you are, when Conveyor AI is going to generate the patch, you're going to able to see the differences between the two um, the uh, the two uh, code code bases, and you'll be able to see okay what changes that I need to bring. Um, and and finally, you can accept those changes, and then that can become part of your pipeline as well. So while it does that, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start my Conveyor AI backend um, to to ensure that I can add. Uh, add those changes via NLM while the static code analysis is going on. Here I have a config file for Conveyor AI. I'm just going to quickly go up. Um, what it does is that it has a Postgres backend um, that, that it basically uses uh, to store the data. But then what Ramon also mentioned is that we're not, we're not saying that Conveyor AI comes with a large language model. Um, it actually works with different la large language models. So it's not distributing them, but it's using them. So here, uh, there's multiple options you can use. We've tried it with Granite, with Mixtral, uh, with Llama Code, you know, and and then you know, Chato Llama, for example, Open um, um, Open AI as well. So there's tons of models that you can use and choose from. Um, and in my case, obviously, I'm using the uh, Mistral model that is you know uh, hosted on on the IBM cloud. What I've also, what you can also do is that you can use something like OpenShift AI uh, and host a model on top of that, and then use VLLM to use that model as well. So there's there's multiple options that you can use. What I'll do right now is to start the server. I'm going to start up my Postgres instance, which is using Podman in the backend. It's going to bring that database connection up, um, and then finally, I'm going to try to run this. Um, the server as well, which is based in Python, and it's going to start running. And what it will do is when it starts running, it's going to connect uh, with the large language model that 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 is being hosted as well. So here you can see that it's connected with the model and it's ready to take requests. If I go back here onto my IDE, so thankfully the analysis is finished, uh, perfect. And if I look at the analysis here, um, let's say the inventory entity, which is a simple Java class file that is basically just an entity storing data. So if you're familiar with Java, if you're not, I'll just quickly explain it as well. The entity is what is being stored into the database, right? So it's like this uh, logical uh, grouping of what you want to store into the database. So in this case, it's the inventory item, which means that all my product inventory needs to be stored stored somewhere. Um, and you can see that it points out that Java X is no longer in use. It's an, it's an old um, annotation that's being used. So if you go in the, uh, um, if you go and look at the uh, incident that is reported, it says replace Java X import statement with Java Jakarta dot persistence, because this happened about 18 months ago, that everything has moved uh, to Jakarta as well. And there's a bunch of other incidents as well, right? So we can see um, all of these being reported, each and every line is reported as one instance. And and like um, like Ramon mentioned as well, that it's not about giving you know taking the entire bulk of the file and and throwing it in and getting a response. It's also about each and every incident that's in the file, which gives us a more intrinsic detail about how do we actually want the output from it. So this is a very simple example. This example we could also do with something without the LLMs, right? But but let's take it, let's see how that works, right? So I go in, I say, okay, um, Kai fix all. And this will basically take all the incidents one by one. It's gonna send it to the backend um, and then it's gonna wait for it to, to provide a response. So here, if I go in, I see that the backend actually received six incidents. You can see over here um, and it created a file and then it, you know, through that prompting, it sent that file back. If I look, in a bit more detail here, well, let's look at the UI first. You can see that it says, oh, um, you know, remove this import statement and add these other import statements here. So it's it's quite quick in doing that. 
it's taking the um, you know taking the recipe from the large language model saying okay i got the incidence uh, you know this is what makes sense um, and this is how it should be and you can see the entire file so here in case obviously this was just the import statements all the six incidents reported so we can only see that but then if i look here uh, um, um, on my on my console it also tells me that this is how it worked it sent in you know, it says generating the fix, it gives the application name, uh, you know, it looks at the incident, uh, it looks at the specific violation that was sent, and then obviously goes down line. So here you have the line number as well to so specifically this specific line number is being targeted. Um, it gives the analysis messages and all of that, and then generates a specific, you know, reasoning uh, for it as well. So here Java E and Jakarta E specification were split in 2017, resulting in Java X package namespace being you know, replaced by Jakarta. So all of this information then pa passed along in, in our prompts saying that we want something with a Quarkus. So here you see in the prompt, you are an AI assistant trained on migrating enterprise Java E code um, to Quarkus um, and basically going on further. And finally, the LLM res you know, responds with an input file uh, with all the changes that were required in this case as well. So rather than, you know, just throwing an entire file out, we are able to throw in the incidents together with the file um, and get the output as well. So here's, here's, that was, that was a very, very simple, simple example. And then you would, you could ask me and say, hey, that's not too complex. And I completely agree with it. That is definitely not complex. But what about something like if we used an, a message driven bean? And here in the message driven bean, uh, if you if you're familiar with Java, um, I, I'll I'll just quickly say this as well. JMS is a technology where you basically send from one angle, um, you know, uh, from one side um, in, of your component, you can send uh, a message um, into <clears throat> into into the uh, into the components, uh, which is basically saying, hey, I have a, I have a topic which is called orders. So as soon as the order is received, the message-driven bean is gonna, you know, uh, send that message out um, uh, to or receive that message from a component and say, "I'm receiving this message on a specific topic," um, and then it's gonna start processing when it's when once it receives that message. Um, and this is how the traditional JMS used to work, right? But re in the recent years, we've been using. Uh, areas where we could actually, rather than this code source code being stuck on while these messages are being processed, could also be used reactively, um, or it could use a you know a different technology like, for example, Kafka at the back end as well. So, so how do we enable this particular source, which was maybe written 15 years ago, um, to something new? If I look again here, um, if I look at the you know details of the different things, we have the import statement. But then we also have other details where we can see that, hey, um, this, this code is not sufficient enough um, to run with something like Quarkus. So you have a message-driven bean here um, that needs to change. The activation needs to change to a message listener, et cetera, all of that. How do we do that? And this is, this is not just import statements. This is, this is regular code that is sending um, messages across the components. So how do we change that? Let's take a look at it. Let's ask Kai to fix all for us again uh, with its nice uh, magic in this situation uh, or not magic. Um, here you would see that, okay, it says you have to remove the import statement, simple, not too complex. But then you see that, okay, it removed all the annotations that we use, for example, the message-driven bean, the destination lookups, et cetera, but then it adds something, one liner here, which is very specific to the Quarkus framework, which is at incoming topic orders. And it's able to do that quite simply uh, with this components. Um, and it's able to remove the exceptions that were in there to convert to the exceptions that we would usually use. So this is maybe a step two of, of that more, uh, you could say, complex uh, sort of scenario as well. If you look at something like, uh, producers. So let's go here um, and I'm going to open the producers file. Um, and you, you can see that, you know, this producers file was being used. If I want to, if I want to say Kai fix all, it tells me that, hey, you, you need to change your code again from Java X to Jakarta E uh, and you need to, you know, rename this annotation as well. So simple enough makes it easier 
um, to, to, to do this as well. What about, uh, let's take, for example, let me take a look here. Uh, yeah, so if we are, if we are having a specific uh, shopping cart service, uh, it has certain messages. Uh, we wanna change that as well. So how would that look? Let's take a look. Um, obviously there are certain instances that you would see the incidents being reported, but here you see that the entire code base um, is being changed as well. Uh, with with what's actually required uh, from there as well. Let me take another example. I think I have a cart endpoint. Here you have the cart endpoint, which is session scoped, um, and it's actually using REST as well. So so that's also that's going to change most likely the annotations in this case as well. So it does the annotations. It does some of the restructuring as well uh, in this case as well. There will be areas that you might not need, for example, in the code too. And let's say if it's a REST application, you don't necessarily need that, right? So, so that's gonna change um, as well. Uh, and, and Kai is going to be able, um, able to do that too. Um, I think I have some, I've shown some good examples, unless uh, Ramon, you have any others in your mind that I could pick up, I'm happy to move that on. That looked great. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So awesome. Let's do that. Um, and let's come back. So so those were a couple of you know different examples that we see. And you see that maybe what I did not show is like if you can accept the changes, they're gonna become part of the Git, right? Once you have something like this, you've changed your Java E application into, into a Quarkus application. So how would that look? So if I go back on my terminal here uh, and I say, hey. You know, uh, I want to I want to start this application as as a Quarkus app. Now, obviously, I have to go through. I think one of the points, maybe I think in one of the questions was, you know, how does the developer workflow look? So fair enough that you know I do a Kai fix all. I get all the different things that I need to change. Uh, that's great. But then once I accept the change, the change becomes part of my current repository. So one of the good practice for you would be to actually branch this out. Um, and and then in that in that branch you can actually start to work with it without disturbing your original project in the in the first place, uh, because there will be modules and things and dependencies that you're using with a traditional application that you might not be using uh, with with the new one as well. So what I've done is that I've already branched this out, and I'm going to um, do that now. I'm gonna. And this repository is also available on um, on the Kai um, GitHub, and we can share that as well. So I've checked this code out. If I go back to the short source code here, this what what I did was that I I basically converted all the files through Kai, um, and then you know once I converted them, you can see all the changes that it shows to me um, that that I have done, etc. Um, and once I'm done, I can start this project, right? So I could say something like MVN, and I think it's time I showed you the cool store, right? So if I did MVN Quark is dev, uh, it's gonna start to bring up my application. Uh, and one of the cool things about Quarkus is that it has it has this functionality where it integrates with test containers in the backend. So it will bring in, let's say, Postgres database, which I'm using, it already understands from my uh, from my dependencies that I'm using, um, I'm using Postgres and it brings that up as well. So let's go and see um, how that looks. What I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna go to my local host. Um, and here it's gonna bring up my uh, cool store application uh, that I've been working with. It's based on Angular and it's gonna load. Uh, it takes a little while. There you go. Um, so you can see that you know this is a different version of Cool Store with even the old Red Hat uh, kind of logo as well, right? So, anyways, um, so I can actually browse through these. I can I can add them to my cart. Uh, uh, amazingly, cart is not found. So definitely, I have something there that I have messed up, um, uh, which we can we can kind of trigger and and see as well, right? So so but the idea is that you're able to see this. At the same time, if I go into my Quarkus um, dev console, um, then I can also see, uh, you know, for example, once my project started, 
uh, it also started my database. Uh, okay, that did not start. Interesting. Uh, yeah, so it did start. Yes, so you have the uh, Quarkus database that is at the back end that it can um, that it can connect to. As an example, once I bring up that, and and that would not be the case if you were using something like um, EAP or or an old Java EE application. All the sets of configurations that are out there, the extensions I'm using. Um, the different things, uh, like for example, the REST easy extension, the reactive extension, all of that uh, is there as well. Now, what I want to do is that obviously I have uh, received some warnings here, uh, which is, yeah. Let me see. I think it's database. Anyways, what we do now is that I'm going to, I'm just going to deploy this onto an OpenShift environment. I already have a project called Cool Store. So what I'll do now is that I'm just going to create a new app. Um, and it's going to be the database backend that I use. If I look in my application properties, um, this is the exact database that I'm using with the login and password, which I've already seems to have uh, been uh, deployed. Let's see if it's there. Did I? Yep. Seems like it's already there, so perfect. Um, and then what I'll do is that I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna add the OpenShift extension, which basically will deploy um, the um, <clears throat> will deploy my code into uh, into OpenShift as well. So if I do something like simple as clean compile deploy, obviously skip tests for everything. Um, it's going to deploy this application using the OpenShift uh, builder images, and and then the Quarkus application would come up into my OpenShift uh, console as well. And the thing, obviously, here the interesting part is that obviously this is not part of Kai, but what's interesting is that we started with a Java E application, a simple Java E application, you know, we which we would have normally deployed in an application server, and we would have basically started, restarted, created deployment scripts, all of these things we would have done with that Java E application to make sure that we can have a deployable build, right? Or create a DevOps process, whatever that might be. Coming to a modern framework like Quarkus, which is very much up to date with all the different skills, you can you can deploy native uh, binaries with it, et cetera, all of that. When things like these or doing live coding or continuous testing, and then deploying it to something like Kubernetes with just one command line, it kind of gives you the possibility why you're actually migrating, right? So here you can see that Quarkus is, is has deployed the application. If I look at the logs, you know it comes up pretty fast. Um, the application is up and running. Um, and then when I click on this again, I should be able to look at my Cool Store application as well. Um, and it's going to take some time for the UI to load. Uh, standard stuff. I'm using Angular 2. I'm not the best uh, front-end developer, hence my front-end skills are limited. And here you can see that, you know, I can add my card, I can look at my shopping cart, similar behavior uh, that we have there. So a nice, simple, successful uh, migration, as as um, as I would call it. Uh, let me go back to the slideshow. So, so what has happened? I think let's sum it up because I've been talking a lot, right? Um, Static code analysis happens with, with the standard tooling that we all are used to with Conveyor IO, takes all the incidents, takes all the requirements. Then what happens is that within the new extension that is the Conveyor or Kai extension, we are then able to look at those incidents and say, fix them. That fix goes into the large language model with all the inputs from the incidents and the source code with exact line numbers, et cetera. And that basically creates that specific, you know, narrow uh, sort of uh, tunnel into the LLM that then generates the exact output that we want from it um, to, to show, um, to have a generated patch to do the migration as well. One thing that I did not show was that if you were to convert an EJB into a REST endpoint, you could also do that as well. So, so all of this brings the power to do this at a much, much more faster speed uh, using large language models. And the beauty of it is that it's not deterministic, right? So you are able to scale this as much as you can, as long as we have good static code analysis and the right kind of hints to do it. From a developer perspective, we have the IDE 
And that's where you do your migration. This is not an automated task that runs somewhere. It's a task that runs in your ID. You're able to validate that code and apply it accordingly. And you might not like the answer, right? But you might like some of it. And that should help you to start changing the code as well. So it's a good tool in that sense to, to bring you that. I want to move on to something important as well. You know, I, I spoke about, you know, uh, the uh, the uh, the refactoring of the application and a lot of time the refactoring of the application is mixed up with the architecture as well these are two different things there's refactoring and there's rearchitecture as well and one and both can be you know in any sequence as you would like however with this approach that we just showed you with all these you know different components that i converted into quarkus uh, during this demo Kai gives you the possibility to start breaking them apart. Kai, Kai will give you the possibility to be more architecture centric and distribute your code as you would like or not distribute your code either, right? Or distribute it in multiple languages um, and you know, kind of refactor or what you say, divide it into multiple languages. So it gives you that possibility. Uh, it doesn't make that decision for you. And that's a very, very important distinction. It's, it's purely focused on the code and not, not specifically on the architecture. So I have migrated, what do I do next? Obviously I deployed the application, et cetera, uh, as an entire thing, right? But once you, once you migrate, you think about something, uh, you have an end goal, why you're actually migrating. It's not just about the code itself. You might be migrating to those four points that I initially mentioned, you know, it might be because of technical debt. It might be because of lack of agility. It might be because you get too much security issues or just, you know, a different cost and, and et cetera. So once you have refactored, Kai is helping you to refactor. It's helping you to refactor simple Java e application to a new modern framework like Quarkus. And, you know, it removes all the unnecessary things that you don't need, EJV to REST, JMS Reactive, lovely. It does that. What it does not do is re-architecture your entire code base or your actual architecture. So it's not doing your separation of concern. It's looking at a file. If that file was written with all the source in it, you know, for the entire application, it's going to convert the entire file, right? It's not going to be breaking that file apart for you in a domain-driven design or a functional design or an event-driven design or for a serverless function. But it will enable you, Kai will enable you to do those things by breaking them up further once it's coming to a modernized framework. I think that's a very important distinction. It should be used as a tool in this practice. The other thing that you might think, okay, I have migrated, but I want it to be more agile, more you know, fast in doing it. Sure, you'll be able to do with re-architecture, but then process, automation, DevOps, those might also be the things that you will be able to more easily do uh, by dividing your code or or using microservice pattern or a microservice pattern, et cetera, et cetera. So those are some of the things um, that, that we should at least have a good expectation, a set expectation that Kai is not going to help you do that. Do those, it will enable you to do those. And I think that's a good distinction to have um, as well. Uh, finally, if you want to know more, you know, you can get involved in the community. We have community meetings, uh, mailing list, Kubernetes Slack. Um, and, and here's a QR code that you can use as well. Uh, my part is pretty much done. So Ramon, I don't know if you want to say anything at this point um, as well. Nothing. I think uh, I think you nailed it with the demo. So I will be uh, open for questions now. Looks like we have a, quite a silent audience today. Yeah, this was so great. Thank you so much, and um, especially the live demos that I know. You know, sometimes, yeah, it, it, it could have issues, but everything worked perfectly. So thank you so much. Any, yeah, any questions? Any comments? Okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Ramon. I saw you already posted the slides on the channel. So thank you. Appreciate yes. it. And thanks, everyone, for joining us today. And yeah, have an amazing week. And I will see you next week. Thank you, Chef and Ramon, again. It was amazing. Thanks for thank having you. us. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. you.